Hey, good morning. I mentioned this in the last service. I want to mention it again because I want you to be aware of the work that Brandon Boyd does uh, for our church. He is a pastor's heart and a, just a brilliant organizational mind, and it is a wonderful combination to work with him and his passion. So give Brandon a big round of applause because he's awesome. So uh, when I was a kid, I think I was a kid, I'm not really sure where I was in middle school, maybe elementary school. My brother uh, went into our den, I think it was one evening in the summer. Uh, we grew up in Georgia and we did not have air conditioning uh, when I grew up. I'm not that old, it's just my parents chose not to have it. And so it's, it, it existed. And so, uh, so my brother got a big old tall glass of milk and he set it on the carpet and he forgot about it. And when he stood up to go to bed, he kicked it over and spilled milk everywhere. Well, he was a dutiful son. He put the towels down, he soaked it up, and then he went to bed. But in 90 degree, 100% humidity, Georgia heat, towels are not enough. And so that room, again, in my childlike mind, my mom's going to hear this and be like, it didn't smell that long. <laughs> but in my childhood mind, it smelled for months in that room. And to this day, if I go to that spot in my parents' house, I feel like I can still smell the spoiled milk, even though I know it's not there. I think they've even changed carpets. But in my mind, it's still there. And there's some stains, like that spilled milk, that spoiled milk, uh, that no matter what you do, you just can't get it out, right? I've got Silly Putty in my floor right now that one of my daughters put there, and it's not coming up. Silly Putty is in that carpet forever. There's things you get on your shirt, that barbecue sauce that's so good, and it's now with your shirt forever, right? Blood is one of those things that stains and stays there, and it doesn't matter what you do. You just can't get it out, and there are some things that happen to us. There are stains on our souls that no matter how much we try, we can't get it out. Sometimes this is trauma. Sometimes this is something that somebody has done to us, abuse, rejection, whatever it might be. Those are stains that no matter how much we try, no matter amount of counseling or whatever, those are wounds that we still carry with us. And we talk about that a lot here at Park Cities. But there's another kind of stain that I do want to talk about more today, and it's the self-inflicted stain. It's the self-inflicted wound. It's the one that stays with us because we reject what God has for us. We make a choice not to follow God's will for our life and instead choose to do something else. And what happens? What's God's response to that? What's the cause and effect relationship that takes place when we make those choices and we make those choices repeatedly over time? So we're in Luke chapter 22. I will be at the tail end of that chapter. And as Brandon said, this is the final verdict series. And we're going to be looking at the three things, kind of this chain reaction that takes place as we continually reject God's will for our lives. The first thing that happens is rejection is corrupting. Rejection leads to corruption. Look at verse 66. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. So this has gone from a small group. Uh, this is the, the, the Sadducees, Caiaphas' little group that met in his house last week. They've now brought it before the entire Sanhedrin, which may have been as many as 70 men. And our, 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 the way the Gospels kind of read and the way our, our image of this is, is that everybody on that council, those 70 men, are against Jesus. That's not the case. It's a, a, there's a small subset that have come in to bring this case against Jesus, but there's a wide spectrum of feeling about Jesus. There's even some men on the council who are fans of Jesus, who are actually his disciples. Joseph of Arimathea, who takes his body off the cross and puts it in his own tomb. He's on the council, and he's looking for the kingdom of God. He's a follower of Jesus. Nicodemus, who we meet in John 3, and then we see him again in John 7, and we see him at the end of the Gospel of John. He is also a follower of Jesus at this point. And so this council has the whole spectrum. And so this, Sanhed this, this Sadducees group, this Caiaphas faction is coming in and they have to convince the rest of the council, a majority plus one, so they have two more than 50%, that Jesus deserves to die. And they're eager to do this. They're desirous to do this. Their presence tells us, the presence of these men tells us that they've got some work to do, that Caiaphas has some work to do. But there's some rules. According to James Edwards, uh, who's a commentator on the book of Luke, there's some rules that they're supposed to be following. One of the rules is that the trials have to happen uh, 
one has to happen during one day, and then there has to be another one the following day. And they both have to be in daylight. Another rule is that you can't convict somebody of blasphemy unless they actually say something that, that curses God's name. Any other form of blasphemy is not a capital offense. Another rule that they have is that you have to, to uh, execute the person via stoning, and then you hang them on a tree. Lastly, one of the rules is you can't have a trial the day before a Sabbath or the day before a festival. And if you know a lot about, if you've been following these trials that we've been looking through, the Sanhedrin violates all of these. They have one trial, and it happens on the day before a Sabbath. That's why they're in such a rush. They want to get this done before the sundown on that day because they want to still be able to celebrate the Passover. So they're trying to get it done. We know that Jesus doesn't have consecutive trials, and even if you want to make the argument that last week's was a first trial, this is a second, fine, they both happen on the same day. They're not two days consecutively. They execute Jesus, Jesus via crucifixion rather than stoning. And Jesus' blasphemy is that he claims to have a special relationship with God rather than outright cursing God's name, which he would never do. And so they circumvent these rules. They circumvent these laws that they've put in place. These are their rules that they've put in place. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're going to do it our way. And not only are they doing it, uh, circumventing their own rules, they're circumventing the law of God. In Exodus 23, 7, it says, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. They know these are false charges. Caiaphas and his crew know that these charges are not legitimate. But they're going forward with it anyway. In the following verse, in 23.8, it says, Take no bribe, for a bribe binds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Again, they're not the ones taking the bribe. They're giving a bribe. They've taken it up another level. They have rejected God's plan and God's will and the way that things should be. Those systems are in place to prevent injustice. They're there to uphold these institutions that, that God has deemed to be right and good and that they want to have. And they're circumventing it for expediency's sake. They're circumventing it because they hate Jesus so much. They're circum circumventing it because they don't want to lose their power. And this is where you see corruption entering into these people. It's already there. You see how the decisions that they're making are corrupting the very institutions, the very things that they want to hold on to. When you choose to follow your way of doing things over the way that God wants them to be done, corruption enters into the decision-making process. And I get it, I do. The youngest parts of the Bible are almost 2,000 years old. They're like 1,900 years old. And you can look at it and you can say, look, there's no way that the Bible has something to say about everything that I face. They didn't even have the internet back then. They had like dial-up. It was awful. It was the dark ages. <laughs> Let that be a drop. Just hold on to that. They, they didn't have that. So how would the Bible know what it's like to deal with, with questions of morality, with social media and, 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 and the internet? Or, or how would they know what to do with my phone? Or how would they know? I've got to choose some things for myself. I've got to, I've got to circle. It's good that the Bible lays down some, some groundwork, but I've got to build on that. You see, what we often do is we think we know better than God because there is an epidemic in our culture today that the current way of doing things is vastly superior than the older way of doing things. And my older people in here are like, yep, told you. No, we do this. We think that the Bible is irrelevant sometimes because it's old. And we choose to do things our own way. One of the ways that this appears is to live an ends justify the means lifestyle. We take something that God genuinely desires for us, like joy or peace or love, and we say, no, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take this gift that God wants to give me, but I'm going to decide how to get it. So if, I want, if, if God wants me to have love, which he does, he wants you to feel love, I decide who to love, who to love me, how much we love each other, when we love each other, what it looks like, how we live, all that stuff. I get to decide the how because God wants me to have it. Or I want to I be successful. I want to I enjoy uh, uh, satisfaction in my job. 
And so we work really hard. We bust our tails for 80 hours a week. Or on the flip side of things, Gen Z, we do bare minimum Monday. Which guys, come on, bare minimum Monday? As a millennial, I'm offended. We learn to do the bare minimum every day of the week. (laughs) It's really, you gotta space that out. Or you decide, I want stability in my life. Or I want comfort. And so we invest again and again and again into our homes. Bigger and better and grander. We take good gifts that God wants to give us. And we make them the most important things. And what happens is when we decide how to get these things on our own, they become poison pills. They take good gifts and make them destructive. Abraham learns this. Abraham is promised a son. God promises him and his his aged wife a child. And he's like, great, God, I trust you for this promise. And then you know what Abraham does? He decides, I'm going to make this happen myself. I'm going to sleep with my wife's servant, Hagar, and we're going to have a son together. And boom, God's promise fulfilled. And God's like, that's not really what I had in mind. He's like, no, 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 no. I want Sarah to be the mother. Because then she gets all the credit. And it's going to point forward to the Messiah. A woman who shouldn't be having a baby is having a baby. That points to something that's going to happen later. And Abraham messes it up because he decides to do it his own way. The ends justify the means. Another way that we do this is when corruption takes root through fear. We're all afraid that God is going to ask us to do something that we don't want to do. I'm going I'm to dive into his word. I'm going to do the dwell readings or whatever it is that I'm going to do. And I'm going to pray and God's going to be like, you need to seek forgiveness from this person. You've got to say, I'm sorry. And we're like, God, really? I don't think I'm going to do. Or you've got to forgive this person. Do you know what they did to me? Or even worse, God is going to make us sell everything and move to some crazy country or Alabama. And it's just going to be awful. I don't want to do that, God. And so what we do is we wind up following after God. In the same way that Peter followed after the arresting party last week. Remember that? He was following after the arresting party, but it was real furtive. He was real kind of in the distance. He wanted to see what was going to happen, but he didn't want to be affected by what was going to happen. And so we do the same things following Jesus. We want to be close enough to receive the blessings. We want to be close enough to be associated with Jesus, but not so close that Jesus can single us out. It's like when somebody's and you're in a group Bible study and somebody says, who wants to pray? And everybody immediately looks down. (laughs) If you don't make eye contact, nobody's going to ask me to pray. I always ask the first person to look down. That's how I roll. So don't look down. We are so scared, just like the religious leaders were scared. We're so scared that God's going to ask us to do something. Now, I know when we talk about corruption, one of the things that you have to start thinking about are your motives. Why do I do what I do? And we don't like to think about that largely because we live in a very busy society. We're from one thing to another thing to another thing to the point where I don't really have time to think about why I do what I do. I just do what I do. Like a train on a track, right? Just going to go, go, go. And what winds up happening is because of this system that we're in, we wind up thinking two things. We either overestimate our value to God, because we think, oh, God needs me. God can't do these things without me, or this thing won't work without me, whatever it is. And we underestimate our need for Jesus. So we overestimate our value, we underestimate our need. And so if you're wondering whether or not you're entering into sort of corrupted decisions, if you want to know as you're following Christ, whether or not you're kind of hanging back, ask yourself, am I overestimating my value and underestimating my need for Christ? And that might give you an idea The cool thing about Jesus, the beautiful thing about Jesus, most people, when you reject them, they kind of step back and they say, okay, fine, I'm going to give you your space. When you're ready, you can come back to me. That's not how Jesus works. When we reject Jesus, you know what he does? He keeps coming after us. Just like he came after Peter. After Peter denied him three times. Jesus extends the hand to us. Jesus wants to draw close to us. I want you to try an exercise this week. Pick a decision. Anything you do this week, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's something significant, insignificant, whatever, I want you to ask yourself one question. Why did I do that? 
when you're, maybe you're doing your dwell reading and you're doing the journal or whatever you're doing and you're like, hey, why did I choose to go have dinner at this place? Or why did I choose to get angry about that? Or why did this bother me? Or why did I get really excited about this? What was it about this? What motivated me? And it doesn't have to be this grandiose exercise. Just prayerfully consider why you do what you do in that one sentence, one instance. It might reveal something about yourself. And it might reveal where some corruption is seeped in that you didn't realize, where some spoiled milk is sitting out in the carpet of your life. And you've gotten so used to the smell, you don't notice it anymore. So that's like a one-time decision, right? Rejection is corrupting. Anytime you reject what God wants for you, anytime you reject when you know God's telling you to do something, you know what God wants you to do, 10 commandments, whatever it is, and you choose to do something else, that's corrupting. That, that introduces corruption in our life. But what happens when you continually do it? You do it again and again and again. Well, it leads to something that's costly. Rejection becomes costly. It is costly. Look at verse 67. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the son of man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. All right. So it seems like Jesus is offering an evasive answer here. And he's really not because one, he knows their hearts, right? Jesus knows everything. So he knows that if he asks them a question, he knows what's in their heart. They're not really going to believe him. But two, from experience, he's asked them questions before. He said, hey, uh, I think he was asking him about re the resurrection. And they refused to answer him. They asked him about where John came from. They refused to answer him. But Jesus is also making an allusion. He's making a reference to another man of God who was speaking to people in authority and he wasn't listened to either. Look at Jeremiah 38. You can turn there if you want. We'll be there for a little bit. It'll be worth, I think, the trip. It'll also be on the screens. And while you're going, I'm going to set up the scene. Jeremiah is a prophet, and he's speaking at a time in Judah's history where uh, Babylon is taken over. Zedekiah is now a puppet king, and Zedekiah very foolishly rebels against Babylon, against Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar is on his way back to put down this rebellion and wreck shop on everything that's Jerusalem. And Jeremiah tells everybody, look, God has said that if we apologize, if we go out to meet Nebuchadnezzar and we submit to him, everybody will survive, everything will be okay, the city won't get burned and it'll be fine. They like that idea so much, they chuck him in a cistern, which is like a giant well. And then Zedekiah fishes him out because he wants to hear him one more time. And we pick up the story in verse 14 of chapter 38. King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and received him at the third entrance of the temple of the Lord. Notice it's at the temple, which is also where Jesus is being interrogated. The king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. And Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, listen to what he says. If I tell you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you counsel, you will not listen to me. Essentially, you won't believe me. And then King Zedekiah swore secretly to Jeremiah, as the Lord lives, who made our souls, I will not put you to death or deliver you into the hand of these men who seek your life. And then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life will be spared and this city shall not be burned with fire and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans and they shall burn it with fire and you shall not escape from their hand. And King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, again, notice, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans, lest I be handed over to them and they deal cruelly with me. And Jeremiah said, you shall not be given to them. Obey now the voice of the Lord and what I say to you and it shall be well with you and your life shall be spared. I hope you notice the similarities between Zedekiah and the Sanhedrin. Both of them are in positions of power, but those positions of power are limited by an external government, an external force. Both are afraid to lose what little power they have. Both have mistreated the messenger that God has sent to them. And both are looking for expediency and survival over faithfulness to what God is calling them to do. And you know what happens? Keep reading in 21. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the vision which the Lord has shown to me. Behold, all the women left in the house of the king of Judah were being led out to the officials of the king of Babylon and were saying, your trusted friends have deceived you and prevailed against you. Now that your feet are sunk in the mud, they turn away from you. 
All your wives and your sons shall be led out to the Chaldeans, and you yourself shall not escape from their hand, but shall be seized by the king of Babylon, and the city shall be burned with fire. Look at verse 5 of chapter 39. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at Riblah, and, sorry, and Nebuch- he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes. And the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. The Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him and the people who remained. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Zedekiah does exactly the opposite of what God tells him to do, and it costs him everything. It cost him his kingdom, cost him his sons, cost him his power, cost him his nobles, cost him his eyesight, everything. And by the way, the reason why he loses his eyes last is because the Babylonians want it to be the last thing he sees is the slaughter of his nobles and his sons. It is a brutal consequence. And the same thing, similar thing happens to the Sanhedrin. 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, they rebel against Rome, Rome comes in and destroys Jerusalem, burns the temple to the ground, and every institution that was tied to the temple, which would be the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, doesn't exist anymore. So much so that we don't really know a whole lot about Sadducees other than what the Bible tells us and a couple of extra biblical sources. They lose everything, just like Zedekiah. And when you continue in your rejection of God's word over and over and over and over again, It will prove to be costly for you too. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, Travis, that sounds like I just, if if I don't do what God tells me to do, I'm just gonna lose my stuff. Sounds like God's a big bully, just takes stuff from us. That's not what I'm saying. Now, is there evidence that God does that? Yeah, it's in the scriptures. We just read about two examples right here. Does God do that? Yes, sometimes I think he does. It's very difficult though for me to look into your life when you're going through a rough time It's even difficult for me to look into my own life and say, God's doing this to me because I did that. Apart from some kind of revelation or prophecy, you can't know that. But what I do know is this. God, I think, more often works in such a way that he allows us to pursue things that he knows are destructive to us so that it will drive us back to him. It will push us back to him. Look at Romans 1. Uh, 24. It'll be on the screen. We won't be there as long as we were here in Jeremiah. Romans 1, 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It says three times in this chapter, three times, that God gave them up. Essentially what God allows you to do is he allows you to pursue the desires of your heart. Exactly like the father in the prodigal son story. The son comes to him and says, dad, I want, I want my half of the inheritance. I want to leave. And the father says, all right, I don't think it's going to work out for you, but go for it. And when we do the same thing to God, God is not some, some uh, person who, who forces everyone to obey what he wants them to do. That's not how he works. He allows us to pursue those things. He allows us to chase those desires. Even though he warns us against them, he allows us to do it. And the reason why he does this is I think he wants you to realize how worthless those pursuits are and how wonderful his love is, just like the prodigal son. Now, you can think of this as punishment, and I don't think that it is. The reason why I don't think it's punishment is if because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, one, the punishment has been paid, but two, punishment has no interest in the rehabilitation of the punished. It only cares that the law is broken and that restitution is exacted. But discipline, discipline calls for the person to come back. Discipline wants rehabilitation. Discipline wants restoration. And so God desires that you return to him. So what does this practically look like? 
Well, I think on one hand, I don't think this is an overnight thing. You don't just wake up one day and all of a sudden God's like, you're under probation, secret probation. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think that this giving up or handing over has to be permanent. I think this is a consequence of constant, repeated, ongoing rejection of God where you're not trying to repent, you're not struggling against sin, you're not trying to to change. You've just embraced it. This is who I am and this is a part of what we're doing. God allows us to experience that emptiness and that deadness to bring us back to him. But there's an additional cost to rejection that we don't think about and it's the cost to God. There's a cost to God as well because God is not satisfied to allow us to have no way back, to have no way home. So that's why Jesus is sitting there on the floor of that Sanhedrin, on the floor of the temple taking that abuse. That's why he goes to the cross He goes there so that punishment isn't the only option, so that we can be restored, so that we can be accepted back if we put our faith and trust in him to get that stain out, to get that corruption out. If we give him our life, then discipline becomes the option. Apart from him, there is only punishment. He makes the way. He takes the punishment for us. That's what grace is. He takes the punishment for us, and we don't deserve it. We don't deserve the forgiveness, but he gives it to us anyway. So what happens if we ignore that and we just keep on doing what we want? Well, rejection becomes cultural. It becomes cultural. Look at verse 70, chapter 22 in Luke. So they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, you say that I am. And then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it from ourselves, from his own lips. Something that's been going on in this entire passage that we haven't talked about yet is the corporate nature of this interrogation. It's no longer just Caiaphas. It's no longer Annas. It's no longer this small group. It is the entire Sanhedrin. We, ourselves, they all. Now, we know there's some dissenters in here, but the council becomes convinced that Jesus deserves to die, that he has spoken blasphemy. Caiaphas and and, and the Sadducees' animosity towards Jesus has now infected the rest of the group. And on behalf of the people of Israel, they reject their Messiah. So much so that in the next chapter, the people are crying out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. On and on. When we consistently and repeatedly and unrepentantly and unashamedly reject God's word in our lives, that uh, rejection doesn't just stay with us. It goes cultural, it goes corporate, it goes viral. And it respects no boundaries. It respects no, uh, no borders that you set up, okay? You can act one way at work and then think you can come home and, and be totally different and your, your family's insulated from that. They're not. You can live one way at home and then come to church and act a different way. It's not insulated like that. That's not the way it works. Corruption, ongoing, that that ongoing rejection becomes like a cancer in your body. And oftentimes when you have cancer, you have the disease before you know you have it, right? It can hide in your body. And sometimes that's the way corruption works in our lives. It hides. We, We become familiar with the stink of it, that spilled milk, and we stay with it. We don't realize that it's affecting everybody else around us. It affects our work. It reflects our job. It reflects reflects our family. It affects everything. This happens to David. When David sleeps with Bathsheba and he tries to cover it up, when he finally comes to the Lord, there is discipline involved. And it sets off this chain reaction. His son with Bathsheba dies. And then he has another son named Amnon who rapes his half-sister, Tamar. And then Amnon is killed by Absalom in revenge And then Absalom rebels and takes over the whole kingdom for a while. And then Joab, his general, kills Absalom, his son. And on and on and on it goes. This is what happens. Rejection of God's word in our life doesn't just stay with us. It hurts other people. It infects other people. G.K. Chesterton, who was an author in, in, in England in the 1800s, was asked a question. There's kind of some debate about how it was actually asked. But they asked him, what's wrong with the world? And his response was two words. He said, I am. I am what's wrong with the world. And many of us look at the TV, we watch the news, we, 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 we see what's happening around us, and we think, what's wrong with this world? What's wrong with that generation? What's wrong with these people? 
And maybe it's high time we looked at ourselves and said what Chesterton said, I am. I am what's wrong with the world. Because the corruption in my life runs deeper than I care to admit. The same things that lead other people to make those decisions are the same things that rest in me. The same things that rest in me. And the very good news today is this, that Jesus doesn't let us stay there. He comes and he puts on flesh and he dwells amongst men and he doesn't just stop at the crucifixion. He doesn't just stop at the resurrection. He is coming again one day to set up a new culture in a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more rejection, no more rejection of God, no more rejection of other people. And we're accepted despite our rejection of him if we trust him. You can be a part of that new culture if you give him your trust. So how do we apply this? How do we make this work out in our life? Well, first, you need to know, like I said, this, 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 this corruption can rest in your body long before you realize it. That secret sin, that private thing that you keep to yourself, maybe you don't think it's hurting other people because nobody knows about it. That's not how it works. Confess. Come to the Lord. Repent. Repent. Receive his grace and his mercy. You don't have to stay in that life. On the other hand, if corruption becomes corporate, guess what? Discipleship is also corporate. Your spiritual life is impacted by other people, and you impact other people with your life. That's why you need to be in a connect group. That's why you need to be in a small group. That's why you need to do those things with the church. We need to be together. That's why we're doing the dwell readings. It's not just about reading the Bible on your own. It's about reading the Bible on your own together, which sounds weird, but it's not. Super helpful. Super helpful. The last thing is that it is well past time that we stopped thinking about ourselves as good people. We need to recognize that the milk that got spilled in our life, whether it got there by our own rejection or other people or whatever it is, we can't get it out. You sit there and you try and get it up. You ever, you know, spilled anything as a kid and you tried to cover it up from mom and dad and it just didn't work? That's what we're like. Our good works are like us trying to get stains out of our clothes before mom and dad catches us. It's not how it works. You have got to come to Christ. Christ is the only one who can Lysol out the corruption in our lives. He's the only one that can do it. And if you do not turn your heart to him, the only thing left is to continue to pursue those empty desires. And I don't want that for you. I'll say this and then we're, we're done. One of the things you'll be tempted to do today is to know that you need to talk to somebody about what's going on in your life. Know that something was said today that you need to address, whether it's confessing to somebody else, confessing to the Lord, whatever's coming and talking to me, and you're gonna walk out of here and you're gonna be tempted to not do anything. You will have taken, if you do that, you will have taken the first step on this chain of events that we're talking about right now, where corruption, rejection is corrupting, and then it becomes costly, and then it will become cultural. Don't let it get to that point. Come to Christ. Come and talk to other believers. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, which is sometimes difficult to hear. And sometimes with messages like this, you can feel like grace maybe got lost in there somewhere. I pray that that's not the case. I pray that we would see the grace, Lord God, of a Savior that takes the cost, takes the penalty for us so that we can come to you, so that we can confess, so that we can repent. Our sin doesn't have to cost us because it costs you, and that's grace. So Lord, let us come to you now in worship and in gratitude for your glory and our good. Amen.